Bingo. Are we? How come Ryan's pinned for the, the beginning of the live? Is that that's so that can be the thumbnail? That is. That I'm sorry. Let me just spotlight Ryan's. myself here. Oh, I think there we're we live now. We are live. All right. Should be. I'm gonna open this up in Facebook. Let's start. When you're ready. Are we gonna start? Are we starting right now? Yeah. I like everybody's costumes, by the way. Let me just get the live video open. Yeah. Rich is a DJ. Jim's the human. I'm human sure all right rich you're the are, are you are you are we are we doing this no we don't want any random stories from jim i think Flying, cr crashing airplanes into into fields or whatever craziness dead people laying on the airplane. runway while he pulls up and oh my god i've, I've only gonna... nearly crashed in an airplane <laughs> i know i know i almost died i didn't, think I, I was, I didn't think I was gonna crash i had to land in bad weather once that was pretty terrifying Really? They had us. They had us. They had us all lined up to land, and it was emergency situations. The land, the conditions were below acceptability, whatever they. And uh, so I'm lined up with all these other planes, and the wind's bouncing me all over. And I'm thinking, oh man, I'm going to crash this thing. And uh, just as I get ready to land, I look over the end of the runway. What's what's at the end of the runway? A crashed airplane. That's where I got to Yeah. But just before I landed, the air straightened out and plopped down at went. So you landed in front of the crashed airplane, like airplane here, and you like beside it. No, it was it was beside the runway. They had wow. it had gone off the runway. Or they had pushed wow. it off the runway. I don't know. Anyway, it was kind of crumpled up. Not didn't look like a fatality, but it, was well, not very inspiring, you know. It's kind of disconcerting. <laughs> Your life is scary, Jim. I, Jim, I'm gonna I'm gonna start this with an introduction, if that's okay. I don't know if I'm qualified to inter inter introduce Jim uh, Schmidt, but I'm gonna I'm gonna try. You know, if I do it, if I say something about you, Jim, I gotta point out that like the last time I went to a Napper convention and you walked into it, which we always go to the Napper convention together, we always share a house and we have a great time and 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 just full disclosure jim's one of my best friends i love him to death and his wife beth is wonderful so uh so but last time we went to the napper convention i saw jim come in and he's got that you got your case with your horn in it and i can't help think that, like there's nothing in this woodwind part of this whole napper convention that's advanced or crazy as what jim has in his case his saxophone and it was it's like 15 years he's been doing it right i mean it's like this guy was ahead of this time 15 years ago with his craziness look at that thing we're gonna talk about that look it suddenly got into focus <laughs> like, <laughs> like amazingly your camera focuses on that but let me tell let me tell uh let me just just try to try to recall you know jim i think we met at my very first napper convention and you were already my hero you had been you had been making uh these crazy um, synthetic pads, and you had had your saxophone, which I saw online, and I was I was blown away. That was the first and only Napper convention where I wasn't an exhibitor or um, a presenter at the convention. So I just went in as a normal old person and got to meet with uh, uh, got to meet with 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 you, and it was awesome. And uh, and you were my saxophone hero. And after that, I think I don't I don't know when you came up with the we we kept in touch and. Um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and at some point you developed your tone hole files and that's when I called you up. And I don't know if you remember this, Jim, but I thought they were so cool and I wanted to work with you and I wanted to do something. And I said, Jim, I want to sell your files. And you said, no, nah, Kurt, I don't have a margin to sell them. And I said, I don't care. I'll just sell them. And do you, you remember that? And I said, I said, I'll just sell them for, I'll just sell them for the same price as you. Cause I can't sell them for more than you. And you said, but you have free shipping. And I said, yeah, I know. So I thought, well, I'll just sell them and you'll ship them to me and I'll pay the shipping and then I'll sell them and I'll just lose a little money on each one. But I was just thinking anything I can do to work with Jim Schmidt. And then, and then you said, no, 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 I'll figure something out. And then you gave me some discount and we've, I've whittled you down through the years as I've worked you, you know, for the last 20 years, I think since then, but I really love that our relationship started that way with, 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 uh, with kind of like both of us giving in, you know, giving up. You gave up some margin that you really couldn't afford, and I gave up, and I was willing to give up 
any margin, <laughs> which I don't know if I could have afforded. If I sold too many, I might be broke now. But um, but okay, I'm gonna tell. Uh, so Jim, Jim, you are a pilot. You're an engineer. Uh, you're a saxophonist. You're uh, a, a flautist. You play your own instruments, saxophone and flute that you created. You race. You race motorcycles, uh, you, you build, you have a company that makes motorcycle racing parts. Um, you, you drive a car that's powered by propane, which you converted to a propane car. Um, you, what else about Jim that's, you have a tree in your yard that's over a pond and you put a net down in the thing somehow and you bend the tree over and then you like the fish go into the net and then you come out and you cut a rope and the tree goes boom and pulls out of the water and it pulls a whole net full of fish that you then that you then use for food so jim i don't know i, I mean you're i seen you do backflips uh people should go on youtube and watch your crazy videos there's you have great stories. You've just done so much, Jim, but, but really you've done a lot for this industry. You spent a lot of time and a lot of your engineering time and patience making products and, and making this the music and the, the woodwind industry a better place. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about, uh, we're gonna talk about your products and then we're gonna talk about, then we're gonna talk about your instruments. Uh, does that sound cool? Ready. All right, let's do it, Jim. Let's do it. Well, we're going to start about with the tone hole files. Great. Yeah. Okay. Tone hole files started out, they've been around for quite a while. But what really made these special was the, uh, the diamond abrasives. You can see it glitter a little bit there. Those are actual diamonds, industrial diamonds. And they're bonded to these little tiny brass islands, if you look at it under a microscope. And diamonds are embedded into the brass. So the brass holds onto the diamonds. And these little islands are located all, all over this thing, and they're embedded in a fiberglass matrix. When I saw that, I knew that was an ideal kind of surface for grinding tone holes. And there's a PSA backing, so it just sticks onto this, this uh, brass disc. And then you put on a pilot. These are the plastic pilot. So screwing on a pilot here. And then it just goes. This is a bow under construction. It's on the tone hole. Let me change pilot too. And you put a driver in there, a key handle driver. And you spin it, grind off the surface, so it flattens out. Very efficient, very durable. And then when you want to check the flatness, you can turn it over and the back side of the brass disc is like an indicator. So you put a leak light inside, look for leaks, check if it's flat. Another thing you can do is just use a Sharpie pen, fat Sharpie pen, and draw a black line across the surface of the tone hole rig. And when the black line disappears, that means you've ground, ground everything off the top that's uneven. And those have been pretty successful. Kurt, you've been helping out a lot moving these things. You move them way more than I do because you're the great advertiser and marketer. <laughs> well, they're they're a great they're a great thing, Jim. Can I? Can I show some of the additions that we did to, sure, uh, to your tone? You know, you've got some so I think this is something that we fundamentally maybe don't even agree on, but um, but you're going to eventually see the wisdom of my ways. I happen to have a drill here at my at my table, my desk, and uh, so no, I, use, I use a drill. 
I use the drill you, quite you, often. How, I don't want to ask you how you like it because I know you'll hang me out to dry. How is it? You like the oh, drill? Oh, great. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. All right, cool. I thought you were. I thought you were like fundamentally opposed to the. No, power. no, no way. No, no way. Okay. So what? So what Stay we do? Time. What we do, Jim, is we 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 make this part, and so this part here that we make to complement your kit. Mm -hmm. What we do is this part right here is is hardened, and the rest of the shaft is not hardened, and that's so that this this shaft can be straightened if it needs to, but this part won't wear out. And uh, it can be straightened mm -hmm. with a normal, like like an, any technique that someone would use, and um, because you want this to be straight, <clears throat> and without a lot of modification to what you're doing, uh, let me just grab a pilot that fits. So we do the same thing. We're putting the we're putting the pilot on here, and got all this stuff right at my right at my desk. Oh, look at that! Some Ultimax key oil, and then we put some Ultimax key oil on there. And when you do these dry uh, under, under power, the grit is too strong. But when you add the oil, you get uh, a smoother finish. What I noticed recently is without oil and the drill, what you do get is less burrs. So that's kind of cool. So like when we're leveling the nickel Wilmingtons that are solid nickel bodies, I don't use oil. So if I'm leveling tone holes on a Wilmington saxophone that's nickel, I'm not using oil and I get a little bit rougher finish. I can go back and finish it with oil, but I don't get as many burrs and nickel is really bad for burrs. But anyway, and then we just put it here. We, we, we put this on the end and I happen to have this bell of this vision saxophone and this kind of way. And we're leveling them like this. And, uh, some people worry about the speed of it or, or that it's going to, that it's going to wear it out. Looks pretty good. That it's going to, that it's going to cut the tone hole all the way down. And one thing I like to do is kind of show like if we drill this for a while, it really takes a long time. Like if, if you're nervous about cutting the tone hole down all the way, it would really take a long time to, to cut through it. See, if, I think if it cut fast, it would have done it by now. But here it is. And I think you'd have to be pretty stupid to do one this long <laughs> in real life. And there it is. And, uh, and there's still a... There's still a pretty fair amount of tone hole. This is one that, that I didn't do. You could see the height. And then this one here, it's a little bit lower, but that was a ridiculous amount of leveling. Cool. So that's our addition to what, 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 what you're doing, Jim. You also, um, is there anything else we need to say about saxophone tone hole files, Jim? Well, just that you got to have use common sense, you know, you don't, you don't file them all the way down. You, keep track of where you're at and you stop as soon as you can. You stop when it's done. You don't need to keep going. Yeah. I've got a question for you guys. What's uh somebody has a question uh Noah's got a question about the rounded the round tone holes. Are these files gonna be good for, for that application? Like a oh, rolled tone rolled. hole? Rolled, yeah. You definitely have to be more careful, and and if they're too out, if they're too out of level, no, because you'll file all the way through the lip. So you want to straighten out the tone hole first. I don't know if you've got anything to bend tone holes to straighten them out, but you want to approach it that way to begin with. Uh, generally speaking, I suggest that you don't or be very careful about it. They do, they've got to be pretty level to begin with. But round uh, rolled cone holes are maybe not the best idea for cone hole filing. Because they, they don't come out level to begin with. <clears throat> and you can file all the way through it. <clears throat> so it's risky. I, yeah. I agree. I agree. I think we agree in the pro shop, right, Ryan? We, we do a lot of leveling first and then... Uh... 
and then uh, then we then we we use the we use the file we do file rolled tone holes but we actually we've kind of made a change more recently where we're not we have yeah we do a lot of it yeah with the body work and then maybe at the little end just to kind of dress them up a little bit but not really using it to to file per se just kind of clean it up a little bit if the surface of the roll is maybe a little uneven but yeah we do a lot of those with the body work you know body work and, and you know trying to raise the low spots and, and tap down high spots it's it's a pain <laughs> yeah i, I have well a said general, general rule for flute file, right? This is a flute. Where is it? This is the flute tone hall file. The diamonds are embedded directly into the disc, into the metal. So that's why they vary from the from the sax ones. The diamonds are are embedded yeah. into the, yeah. Uh, they have a sax files have a skin that's replaceable, not so in the flutes. The flutes have to be so precise you can't have the skin. It's got to be. This disc is actually machined and its surface. So, and then the diamonds are applied. So the rule on flutes is you've got a rolled tone hole that you don't dress the flat down to where the flat is more than one third of the width of the rolled tone hole of the roll itself. You go past one third of a width. If it goes to half the width of the rolled edge, you're, you're, you're threatening to, to file all the way through. And I've, found, I've seen people that just file all the way through, not necessarily with my files, you just take a file to them and go all the way through a rolled tone hole on a flute and basically ruin them. Uh, so it just depends on your tech. Some decks, some techs are fast, you know, and uh, make mistakes. So you just so, gotta be real careful on rolled tone holes. Tell us about your flute set, Jim, since we just talked about the, the sex. Hey, to round out the sex set, the sex set is, is a, this is a product day, right? So we talk in products. And so the saxophone set is, um, has, we, we, we offer Jim's basic saxophone set. And, and I mean, super basic, super awesome saxophone set that has the T the handle that he showed you. And like, uh, I think uh, seven files or Rich probably knows better than me. And then we also offer sort of the all in all set that includes the drill file and the oil you need, the extra sets, and then we make some extra pilots for it. So so, so that's the saxophone set, but the flute set, what, what does that come with, Jim? Okay, the flute set is pretty simple. You just get, you get one disc, fits all the tone holes, and there's different size pilots. How many pilots are there? Five different pilots. So it works all the way down from the tiny trill tone holes to the foot. And all you do is change this plastic pilot on the front. Uh, the files we sell now have diamonds embedded on both surfaces, front and back. That way you've got a, you can just reverse it if the thing wears out because eventually things wear out or they clog up. And it's got the Allen wrench, ball end Allen wrench goes in the back side. And you don't you don't want to use a motor on a flute because you're hardly taking off any. To begin with, flutes are pretty precise. Um, you know, a Haynes or granite or Powell, whatever. They just need a tiny little bit of dressing up. And most of them have soldered tone holes with a, with a straight rim on them. The cheaper floats have the rolled tone holes, and those ones have to be careful with and not have the flat get more than one third of the overall width of the roll. So all you do is you put this file inside the tone hole and then turn the driver. I don't know if you can hear that sound there. That's the abrasiveness. And I've got two or three different grits, standard grit and a finer grit. The finer grit is so fine, I don't know why people use it, but they still buy it to dress it up against to smooth it off. And flutes have a problem with pad stickiness. And sometimes it's best not to get the tone hole edge completely smooth. If it's completely polished, it actually has more tendency to stick than if it's rough and has tiny little scratches for air to get in. So that's really all there is to the flute tone hole file. It's just three pieces, uh, several of the pilot, 
the disc, and the driver. Awesome. And Do you use any really oil when you're doing? Oh. Uh, no, you're just not taking off taking off enough metal to need to bother with. Uh, okay. Oil might help keep from the uh, keep the diamonds from clogging up. I don't know. Uh, and it's something I had just haven't controlled. I haven't. I haven't put any uh, information out there about oil, and if I did, a lot of techs probably wouldn't listen to it anyway. You know, they just do it their own way, no matter how many instructions you get, get to them. What about uh, what about? Um, so, how do you clean it, Jim? Like the the do you can you clean that? You, you keep saying it. they get clogged. What's that? You don't. They don't get clogged up right away. I'm saying eventually. You know, after hours and hours, and uh, then you can just flip it over and use the backside. Now you might be able to clean up in a ultra, ultrasonic cleaner. I think someone has mentioned that. But uh, I mean, it's a very narrow edge that you're working on, and there's not a whole lot of variety of sizes. You only have one disc for the whole flute. So they don't last forever, but they do last a long time. I don't sell a lot of replacements, you know. I sell yep. a lot of sets. Uh, rarely do I ask you know, for a replacement, except for a flute company who is really hammering them all day long, you know. And uh, then if I get them back, sometimes I can see where the, the diamonds are, are gone. But they stay there quite a while. And there's a lot of, you know, I mean, something like this may seem real simple, but I've gone to several different companies getting the diamonds on there correctly. And I've had people really screw it up. And I've had a, one company that puts them on right, one application, and the next application, I don't know what they do wrong, but it's messed up. And I complain to them and then I get customers returning them. So I've been through like several different companies. I finally got a company that's really reliable, does good, consistent work. And that's, there's a lot of that that goes on in this business that you don't see behind the scenes, getting a quality work, consistent work that's affordable. Uh, yeah. And not only that, like I said, they, they plate both sides of this thing which is really cool. And, uh, you know, if they do it in quantities, I'm real happy with, with, with the, what they're putting out now. And the, the flute diamond files, I mean, they're tricky because they have to nickel plate this disc. The diamonds are embedded in the nickel that they plate onto the disc. So all of that's very critical, the nickel plating and everything. And that's why I had to go through several companies to get it right. Because uh, they would not put on enough nickel plating or the nickel plating would come off, whatever. Uh, but these these people that are doing it now are doing a great job. It's stellar work. Great. Thanks for taking all that time, Jim. That's why your products are so great. You've always continued to improve them, with, and 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 that's that's kind of been your mantra th since I've known you. Uh, can can we can we talk about your uh, your your flute leak isolator? All right. Let me get the camera resituated. Well, maybe I can just hold it. Okay, here's the old music magnetic magnet here. That's vintage. It is? <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Oh, yeah. But it, it works fine. I'm happy with it. You've got the gauge here, which shows how much is leaking. This vertical gauge. Let me get this thing turned on. This vertical gauge. It's got a little ball. There we go. See the ball running up and down. I like to keep mine down around between two and four for a flute, because you don't need much air. And then this dial calibrates the needle. You can see I'm moving the needle there. I like to set yep. that on about number eight. Eight for the flute. Okay. This is the leak isolator. The brass tube. And you can see there's a hole in the end of this plastic piece. So
you take the hose from the magnet helix. This is air pressure. It's feeding through this brass tube. Goes through the tube. Comes out this hole. Okay, we've got the linear chromatic fluid here. And you just slide in the leak isolator. And, oh, let me show you something first. You see there's a black line. Beth? Yep. Can you give me some magic dust? Oh boy, Beth, get the magic dust. Magic dust? <laughs> yeah, magic dust, okay. All right, here's the magic dust. Now, this is not something- We can't sell that yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is industrial, okay? So take a little bit of this, put it on these drill rings. And that, uh, this is molybdenum disulfide. It's a mineral, it's non-toxic. You can eat it if you want to. And it won't do anything for you, it won't hurt you. Like eating Sprinkle dirt. it on those catfish you catch in the pond. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Slide this in there, makes it flippier. Oh, I forgot to show you. This black line here helps you locate it. So you slide it in. You look inside the tone hole. Let me see if I can do it for you. See the black line? Right in there, so you know it's in the center of the tone hole. The black line's in the center of the tone yeah. hole. And the hole is in the yeah, black line. So. On the camera. But yeah, we, we, black we get it. Look inside and line it up there. Maybe you can see it. So there's an O-ring on each side of the tone hole. Oh, sorry, Jim. Yeah, the, so the rubber O-rings are straddling, straddling the tone hole. So now this one tone hole is isolated. When I shut that key, Beth, oh, my helper's not here. Beth, get the magic dust. <laughs> <laughs> all this. Let me relocate the camera here. Let me imagine it. Hey, Beth. All right, we got it going here. So I'm now I'm shutting the key and go watch the needle move. Oh, yeah. It's just about down to zero. Anything less than one is a good seal. You said you like anything passion. less than one, Jim? Yes. Yeah on a single pad. Even less than two is usually okay. Now I've shimmed this thing pretty tight. But uh, it's basically comparison. You go from flute to flute and you get an idea of which number, what numbers indicate a good seal. And that's one way of using it. Another way, sorry, camera's getting all over the place here. Another thing you can do is you can remove the head joint and then cork off one end of the flute with a rubber plug. I don't have it with me right now, but a rubber plug goes into the other end with a hose on it. And then you can close the entire flute, shut all the tone holes at once, and then get your reading. And that'll show what the entire flute, how much the entire flute is leaking. So all these tone holes adding up is going to add up to some leakage. There's no such thing as a perfect leak, no non-leak flute. There's going to be some leakage, unless you don't have any tone holes. But when you've done a good job of shimming and your flute is playing well, then you make this test and you calibrate the magnet helix 
like I showed you, or use your own calibration. And you make a record of that. So you know what a good flute is supposed to show on the mag magnet helix. And that way, when you're done patting a flute, you know what you're sending out is a good pad job. And if the customer complains, well, maybe it's the customer. And you've got something to rely on, something to fall back on, at least for your own peace of mind. So you know, how your own work is progressing and gives you a standard you can work with. And there's a lot That's of cool. other things I'll use it for. You want to go ahead and say something so I go into the next little I, subject? Just I was just going to say, so you, it's it's cool that you're able to test the whole flute, and, and then with the leak isolator, you can test just one pad, and so that's um, so so and and I also should point out, Jim, that some these products that you've been talking about, they have been, these were these are products that you invented a long time ago. So there's other there's other similar products on the market now, but these are these are yeah, I'm in a, a very big way your your idea. Yeah, I'm the first one that came out with the leak isolator. First one, it was just used for the entire flute. And this one works very well. There's other ones out there, but this one works well. Uh, so I really haven't had to change it. It's just, I've got two different size plastic pieces here because, well, actually, two different size O rings because there are a little bit of variance in flutes. Some of them are a little bit tiny, a tiny bit smaller. So I have a smaller O ring that's just a couple thousand of an inch smaller, so it's not so tight. You can just change the O-ring and then slide this in, in and out of the loop. Thanks, Jim. Thanks. We want to we want to talk about your pads now because that's another that's another thing that you've that you've really pushed on the industry and um, or pushed pushed through on, in this industry and that, that that has had a lot of success. And let's let's see what's up with your pads. Okay, well, I want to kind of connect the pad with this magnet helix right now, okay? And uh, I do a lot of <coughs> development with pads. It's continual. And it's very uh, exacting. It drives me nuts. And uh, <laughs> I just used it the other day. Okay, what I've got here... Whoops. And I just dropped it. Okay, this is one of my black gold flute pads. And hang on. I think it's in the focus. It seemed to want to focus. This is one of my gold plated flute pads. It's kind of hard to really show you, the gold plating. Are you on an iPhone 2, Jim? What are you working with? No. The four iPhones no. had numbers. Anyway, so We're, what I'm there, doing now... Go ahead. With flutes, they're very, very precise. You don't want any leakage or as little leakage as possible occurring with the flute pad. So I use the magnet helix here. And uh, I've got a little tool. This is a tone hole, or it represents a tone hole. This edge being the tone hole. And it's soldered to a tube. And I just set this up with a little stand. Plug the magnet here we come to the tube. And I want to see how well the pad feels. So I'll set the pad on here. Got a little piece of tape on the back so it doesn't leak through the center. Hmm. Set that on the dummy tone hole and I put a weight on it. Turn on the magnet here. All right, I can't do everything right now because uh, it's got to be perfectly centered on here. And I have to eyeball it, get it all lined up. But 
once I got it lined up, I get a reading on the leakage with the magnet helix. And my current project, right now I've got a, another pad, it's really the same. The only difference is it's a thicker cushion. I'm experimenting with a thicker cushion. Uh, people like the pad to be quiet. And with today's super flat pad, either the Jim Schmidt gold pad or Straubinger pads, they're very flat. But the cushion is thin and they're kind of noisy compared to the old style big thick felt pad. Okay. When a felt pad is played for years, it packs down, gets hard, it gets noisy too. But uh, I'm trying out a thicker cushion right now. I'm not sure if I'm going to come out with it or not. It seals okay. I just got to make sure that it's going to go fabricate, come together. Because any time you change one thing, it affects other things. And so when I put in a thicker cushion, that means the supporting structure in the back's got to be thicker and got to make sure that this is a key thin, et cetera. So that's in development right now. That's the flute pad. Jim, can you talk uh, about the difference between your pad and the Straubinger pad in their Yeah, the Straubinger pad, I got to give Straubinger some, Straubinger some credit, okay? He came out with the first flat pad, okay? He came out with a pad that had a rim around the outside, and then you insert the cushion inside the cup with a rim around the outside, and then you stretch the skin over that rim. So it's like a drum head, that rim is flat. I mean, the, that skin is flat. Uh, actually, Brannon Brothers, I think, were the first. There's an argument there who came out with this pad first. Uh, Brannon Brothers claimed to have come out with it first, but Straubinger patented it first. And uh, so it's very successful. And then Brandon Brothers wanted that pad because they had invented it. So they had personal interest in that pad and they pushed it and it took off. Now, the big difference in my pad is it uses a mylar skin instead of a bladder skin, which is a stretchy, uh, skin, fragile skin, very fragile. And uh, I could not wrap my skin around the outside. It wrinkles up too much, it turns into a mess. It doesn't glue, you can't glue it like bladder skin. So what I had to do <clears throat> is start with that outer rim, like Straubinger had patented, and stretch it, that skin over the top of that rim. And then I had to fasten that skin. And the way I fastened that skin was to put another ring around the outside of the skin. And it's actually a tiny little groove in here. I design this stuff and work it out under a microscope. It's so small. And that outer ring has a ridge and it pushes the skin in that groove so it locks it into place. We have special tools. <clears throat> we use to stretch that outer ring to a larger diameter and flip it in place and then it snaps back down into a smaller diameter hold that skin. We can just barely get this thing together. A miracle, okay? And uh, then in the center, the same deal. I've got a, a rim that sticks up in the center. And so the skin goes past the center and I have a little Delvin collar. I push in the very center and it tucks the skin inside that hole and clamps it from the inside because it's interference fit. So it's clamped both on the inside diameter, the small inside diameter. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a, a white plastic collar in there. And it's clamped on the outside diameter. So it's stretched around both on the inside and the outside, and it's clamped on the outside like a like the like those knitting needle things, you know, where they have the fabric stretched across and then there's another band that goes around the outside to hold it in place. And I was able to patent that. So I got my own patent on this style pad here. Uh, and of course, the reason I use a mylar skin is so I can gold plate it. 
that's a lengthy process. I have to eat myself. No one else offers a plating that's durable enough to live up to the rigors of flute playing and the moisture. So that took me like years to develop that. And I've got two, two different skins. I got the one with the gold plating, and then there's one that's called black gold. And it's the same pad without the plating, but it has a special surface on it with a meridian disulfide lubricant, which is also with a gold plated pad, it's just underneath the gold plating. And uh, that helps prevent it from sticking. Because when you get a smooth, slick pad like this, no matter what it is, or say if it's silicone rubber or even Teflon. If you try to use a Teflon skin, it's going to start to stick. It's just the characteristic of smooth surfaces. It's cap called capillary action. And when you get a perfect seal there, it doesn't want to separate. And so you need to be able to, be able to break apart. And to do that, you need to create a little bit of a roughness on the surface of this tiny little air pocket. And so that's what we have with the uh, magic dust that's actually embedded into the skin. It's embedded in the skin of the gold pad, too. So the cone hole actually penetrates through the surface of the gold layer, just at the cone hole surface, and hits the uh, lubricant, and that prevents it from sticking. So it, it took years and years to get this developed. Uh, and there's a lot of problems on the way. Another thing I had to do on the back side of this pad, you can see that's aluminum. You wow. can't make yep. this pad out of plastic. It won't stay flat. Uh, the stronger pad gets away with it, but not on mine. I, mean, I just tried to get rid of that and go back to plastic and couldn't do it. It doesn't stay flat enough. So we have to make this aluminum backing and we use high strength 7075 aluminum so it won't bend. And then I have to anodize it so it doesn't corrode. So there's this aluminum piece and there's two rings on the outside. You know I have to snap on a plastic ring. And the trick with the plastic ring, that first ring where the uh, Meyer skin goes around that first ring, that ring, mm -hmm. that lip has to flex because mylar does not stretch. Mylar skin stretches, so that ring doesn't have to stretch for a regular Schrodinger pad, but on my pad, that, that ring has to flex inward when this pad is pressed hard on the tone hole and the skin deflects. So it has to deflect inward when it's pressed down hard and then it pops out instantly as soon as the pressure is released. Uh, that was a trick too, getting that thickness of that ring just right so it flexes the right amount. And so that, that ring has to be plastic and that ring is assembled onto the outside of this aluminum disc. <clears throat> this aluminum disc. So it's kind of a complicated pad, but uh, <coughs> it's what we had to do to it work. You know, there's simpler ways to do it, but this is the only way. It's like uh, Edison said, there's a thousand other ways that don't, there's a thousand ways that don't work, you know. And uh, you find the one that does. And that's what we basically did. We went through a thousand different versions until we got to this one. And haven't even been able to, haven't been able to change this one. So we're stuck with this, but we're happy with it. It's working really well. Uh, the Myra skin is extremely durable. It lasts two or three times as long as the bladder skin does. Uh, the gold skin has a great sound. It's very reflective. It doesn't absorb tone, it reflects it. And um, or the durability, so something else. Just the acoustic property. So oh, the other thing our, is oh, not affected by weather. Let me get that one in. Glass and pads, but they, when you go into humidity, they loosen up. They get wrinkled. You've got a flappy pad. Sounds like it's a zoo, you know, mm -hmm. can buzz. There's always say. Stay tight. You can soak this thing in water. It doesn't change dimensions. It doesn't change. Anyway, go ahead. I was just saying, Jim, that, that that's the same, a similar surface to your saxophone pads, right? Um, uh, similar, but not the same. <clears throat> Here's the sax pad. Let me talk about that now. Sure. Tell us about it. 
Okay, the sax pad is the same basic idea. I went through a lot of different sax pad designs, made different materials. I ended up using the ultra suede cushion, same as on the street. It's thicker, but I like the ultra suede because it doesn't swell up with humidity and it's very durable. <coughs> now the, the skin surface on the sax pad is basically the same, it's just a little thicker. And it's bonded to the surface of the cushion, the mylar skin. The process of bonding the gold, the very thin gold to the mylar skin is the same. But we don't stretch the skin over the outside. It's just impractical for a sax pad. They get too large in diameter, and it's just a nightmare, you know, if you try to get all that to happen. It doesn't work when you get to those larger diameters. Size changes things. In physics, you learn that, you know, some things work, like I say, you know, tiny little things you can drop and it balance. Take the same thing, thousand times bigger, and you drop it and break into pieces. So anyway, the sax pad got a gold surface. You also have them with a black gold surface. And it's a choice for customers. The gold is just the pure gold is definitely more pleasing cosmetically. Uh, there's an argument that it reflects tone better. Uh, I let people go ahead and argue about that and do their own testing. The black gold has the lubricant embedded in the surface of the skin, so the the pure gold and at the tone hole edge where it wears, the lubricant starts migrating through right there, keep it from sticking. You've got so, the smooth resonator here and the screw in resonator here. And and you you develop these skins, Jim, for for to make the saxophone beautiful, to look good, to seal good, to not stick, to play better, for what? All of the above, plus longevity, you know. I mean, I started like, I started with sax, leather sax pads like everybody else, okay? And I put them in my horn. I'd get real meticulous about it, get them all feeling perfectly, and then play for two or three weeks and look at them. They're all over the place. They work like crazy, you know, and it just drives me nuts. And, uh, you know, that was 30, 40 years ago. And over all that time, I finally turned to this. Uh, the skin, it just turns out there's, enough availability nowadays, modern technology, there is a skin that works really well. Uh, the skin is, in, is, like I said, is bonded to the surface of the cushion. It's a thicker cushion, of course, from the saxophone. And then it's a Delrin, Delrin backing It's a cup. The cushion goes into the cup. The skin hangs over the edge. It's rolled around the edge of the cushion, and then it's inserted into the cup. And then we got to get this surface flat. About two or three years ago, I learned how to make this surface very flat. So it lays on the tone hand. Gives you a perfect feel. How do you install those, Jim? Is it the same installation? What do you, how do you install those pads yeah. typically? It's the same installation. The only difference is you don't use shellac. If you use shellac, it can snap. Shellac is very brittle. I've had people use shellac and the shellac shears all the way across. The shellac still stuck to the pad. The shellac still stuck to the, to the cup and the cup falls out. So it's the shellac that fails. <clears throat> so you use a flexible glue. Any of your hot glues work. Um, uh, you know, your favorite hot glue. Hot glue gun and the, the air gun that you came out with is a great invention. That's what I use to install these. You don't use the flame, you use the air gun so things don't screw up. Because they'll, they'll burn at the same temperature a leather will burn. You don't want to overcook it. And then you manipulate, manipulate it around just like you do a regular pad. Whatever your technique is, you use credit card or whatever. And I've got that other little trick where you can mount a spring on the back of this. I sell a spring and you melt a little bit of a hot glue, a little spot on the back, a lot of steel liquid 
you put the spring into the liquid hot glue. And once the hot glue cools, you cut off the spring about an eighth of an inch long. So then when you put your hot glue into the cup, put your pad in, set it on the tone hole, close the cup, the spring pushes the pad out against the tone hole. And when you warm up the glue, it just automatically levels itself. You don't have to manipulate it around. Uh, some people use the spring, some people don't. A lot of people, once they develop the techniques, they don't change. But uh, it's an option I offer. It works for me. I, that's the way I install them when I, when I use the hot glue. Awesome. Jim, I love your outside of the box ideas. Uh, I, uh, I think, I think we, I think we should, we should, we should move along from products and just for, just take a minute at the end of this video to uh, look at some of the cool stuff that you do. Just, you know, I guess when I introduced you, I didn't mention the fact that you're also a saxophone maker, <laughs> which is a really big part of your life. Uh, can we, can we, can we look at your saxophone, Jim? Can you just say something about it? Show us, show us. There's a body on the construction. You make the body. You got the Actually, I'm getting people to help me. This is, this is so labor intensive that I at least have the bodies made for me now. Okay. I used to do that. The Beth, can go give me those ceramic, those ceramic pieces. Beth, get the magic dust. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On the food bench. All right, here's a finished tenor. It's got stainless steel key work. It's much stronger, lighter than brass. It's because I'm going through precision and reliability. Now, the reason I got into this, I'm going to put this down and show you the flute right now. When I was playing the flute, I thought it'd be really cool to have a flute made out of glass. So I took a piece of glass tubing, I cut a bunch of holes in it, and there was a chromatic layout. You close one hole after the other, straight on down the line, because there's no keys on that flute. And I had a whole bunch of, had all the notes on there, and I looked at them, and I said, well, wait, wait a minute, how come we're playing this? awkward C-scale flute with all the sharps and flats all over the place. And so that's where the idea came from. And I got myself into a whole bunch of trouble and ended up redesigning the flute and the sax. So a chromatic layout. All these are semi sets semi-tones, half sets. Hold on, Rich, let's teach you. So you just lay down one finger after the other. Like a half step, like a whole step. And then you put them together to make it easy. Like so. And then later on, of course, I had to have a saxophone. And I actually play the saxophone a lot more now because I'm in jazz band. And it's the same chromatic layout. <laughs> Jim, sure. The big, oh, sorry. The big deal was getting the ergonomics laid out right, getting your hands comfortable. See how easy that is. Putting all the touch pieces in the right position. Go ahead, Kurt. You had that, had a question? 
Oh, I got a bunch of stuff I want you to share about this thing, Jim. I mean, you got the triaxial mechanism. I want to know the, I want you to show a chromatic, go down the horn chromatic. Let me ask you some questions, Jim. I don't, I, I'm sure you have a way to show it, but let me, can you just finger down the saxophone and show us like start on, maybe start on some note and show us. Okay, it starts with assumption. That's C sharp to C. C to C sharp. And I start with my finger. And go to right hand, same deal. Starts with the thumb. But you're holding down G sharp when you go to right hand, right? G to G sharp. This is my thumb here. Hmm. Now there's a guard back here that keeps the sax off my body so I can use the sun piece without interfering with my body. And then when we get down to the bottom here, you got 10 fingers, and you got 12 notes. All open makes 11 notes. So one finger has got to do two notes. And that's the right little finger here. This is the touch piece for the right finger. And it goes from E flat to E. <laughs> Nice. Can, can I point out that that feels different than anything anyone has ever felt on a saxophone ever? It feels like you're shifting. You're actually, you're actually, it, you push down and that activates it and then you shift forward. It's just like in my Volkswagen, you push down to get to reverse. Yeah, it depends yeah. on where you hit it. I go to E flat like this. Or I go in a different direction and I go straight to D like this. So cool. And you get used to it, and it just becomes, uh, you know, part of your playing like everything else. But it's a little more complicated. That's called the D lever there. I don't think there's that exists on any other instrument. I'm not sure if it does or not. And then it goes straight on down the line, goes further down the C sharp there. And then you switch to the other hand for the for the lowest note. Let me see if I can get that right. There's C, there's D, and there's B flat. So everything's linear to it. Let me show you that again. C, D, and B flat. You can see it better over here. Uh... All the trills and tremolos are available where they're not necessarily there on the conventional horn. Even the uh, E flat to a C sharp is here. Hey Jim, I have a question. Um, Julian's asking why the why is the tenor saxophone slightly less expensive than the the alto? Because altos are smaller, they're harder to make, and I have tenors on hand to sell. Uh, the alto, I just finished one. And uh, it's tighter. The keys are tighter, mm. uh, closer together. Um, it's more difficult to build. And it's just because I'm starting off. If I have to build an alto, I've got to really take a few steps back. Right now, I'm building four tenors at once when I can find time to do it. That way, I can do one job and do the exact same job in the next center 
So I'd have to look through the shop, find the right tooling, figure out what I'm doing. It's my first step onto mass production. It's not mass production, it's just better than one at a time. So I'm trying to get through these four tenors right now, and I don't really want to build out those. Uh, after I get the four tenors done, then maybe I'll build four altos. I got enough parts now to build 40 horns. So I've got my work cut out for me. Uh, wow. But I do have all the bodies, bells and bows, necks. You know, I have to make the key work as I go. There's, how, uh, how long does it take to build one? It's, it's ridiculous, you know, because they're handmade. Uh, I can't even say, it's not even fair to say. Uh, I could probably get it down to a month by myself, you know, with, in the, with the crude techniques I'm using now, which is, you know, very meticulous and, and it's, uh, you know, it's just hand, hand craftsmanship, uh, not a lot of stamping. Uh, I'm getting better at it though, like these posts, I'll get a close up of the post here if I can. All right, there's one right there. You can see that's a that's actually a piece piece of eight inch thick brass sheet. So I'm having those cut with water jet cutting. So these are supplied to me. I don't have to make those anymore. You used to have to machine these on a mill. You can imagine how long that takes. Uh, so all the posts are made for me now. Yeah, there's a good picture. There's a post, yeah, you've got it up towards the right in there, the left in. That helps me a lot. And uh, when I can, I have a helper. It helps me like make the stainless steel cups, press those out. He can do that on his own. Um, there's also a skill shot I sent you. I don't know if you got it handy, but a picture of uh, I can show you one right now. Here's a bow with the ellipses cut in it. You have to cut these ellipses in it before you draw the tone holes. That takes some time. <clears throat> that can be done on a mill. Something like that should be done on a program CNC machine mill, so it just hits them all. And then it, another machine pulls out all those tone holes. Well, I have to machine all these by eye and by hand on manual mill right now just because I don't have a CNC mill. I was CNC lathe and I was CNC mill. And then another machine would just pull out all the tone holes automatically. I'm a long ways away from that. Now, right now, here's a tone hole pulling tool. This goes where the tone hole is supposed to be. And this big piece goes inside. And then with this bolt, I pull that big slug up through this ellipse. And if everything goes right, get me a tone hole. Now, that's not automatic. Before I do it, I have to kneel the edge of every one of these ellipses so it doesn't tear. Um, there's other ways of doing it because this tool here, you can build with ridges on it and spin it. When it comes up, up there, it'll form the tone hole that's putting the edges. I'm not there yet. So it's very time consuming, but uh, it's important to me. And it's kind of my, uh, my main thing. My main it's awesome, thing. Jim. So I'm gonna be building horns and the idea is to make some horns out and be able to bring the price down. Uh, once I want to build these four at once, maybe that'll help me bring the price down. Right now, it's just been too time consuming. And, you know, it's taken me an entire year in my spare time to make a horn sometimes. It's because I'm working every day. I only have an hour or less, you know, or once in a while to work on the horn. The full time be a lot better. I'm just not there yet. <clears throat> That's great, Jim. It's really great to see your see your the work you've done, your flute, your saxophone. Um, there's so much great stuff on those there's the, those those instruments and and in everything you did. I think 
I think uh, by way of wrapping up this this video, I, I want to say uh, I want to say that we all appreciate what you do and what you've done, and for to raise the level in our industry and caring so much about. I mean, I could just go on forever, making pads, making great pads, caring about tone, caring about the instrument, um, being an all around awesome dude. One of the things, one of the stories that you told me that makes me laugh the most is when you said you were playing a gig with your crazy looking saxophone and some kid asked like, hey man, look at that saxophone, where'd you get it? And you just had had so many people ask and stuff. You just said, oh, I don't know, man. I just picked it up at a tag sale and kept, <laughs> kept playing. <laughs> that kid, it probably changed his life. He's like, what the heck happened there? I don't even know what that guy, you know. Jim, I could I could talk to you forever and and, and uh, thank you. Thanks for coming out here. Thanks for doing it. And and for, for Ryan and Rich, thanks. And Matt, thanks for being here and all you out yeah. there that checked it out. Thanks for checking it out. And, we all appreciate you, Jim. Thanks so much. Oh, yeah. Thanks for having me. Yep. Thanks, Jim. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.